Good morning, church. It's good to see you this morning. We have several, as I look around, several holes. And some of them I wasn't expecting, so we need to check on those folks this week. We're thankful for visitors that we have. I hope that you'll come back and be with us whenever you possibly can. This morning, I want us to look at a lesson that's simply entitled, Worship is a Time of. This is not a picture of her. I don't have, well, actually, I do. But there's a little girl one time in the congregation that I was. She was probably six or seven years old. We'll call her, for lack of a better term, we'll just call her Janice. Janice was a beautiful child. She was the youngest of two little girls. Janice has since grown up and is now married and is, unless she's had it within the last little bit, expecting a, a baby. Janice, though, as we said, she was five, six years old, and she came out of church one morning. She came out of the, the auditorium. She came running into the foyer. She was ahead of mom and dad, and she turned around, and, and she looked at mom and dad, and she looked at me, and she smiled, and she looked back at mom and dad, and she looked at dad especially, and she looked up at him, and she said, I did, but I did good in there, didn't I, talking that she'd pointed to the auditorium. Now, you got to understand, mom and dad, not super strict, but strict, then they wanted their girls to worship. They wanted them to, to be good worshipers of God. And evidently, according to what dad told me as he walked out, the week before, she'd been a little restless. She hadn't exactly sat still uh, as she should have, and maybe even whispered a few times to mom and dad. And so I did good in there, didn't I? And Dad patted her on the back and said, you did better. We'll talk about it when we get home. We come together to worship. We come together upon the first day of the week to worship Sunday morning and Sunday night, and then we come together for a special Bible study on Wednesday night. When we come together to worship, do we understand why we're coming and what we're coming for? What is our purpose of worship? What do we hope to accomplish in worship? Those are questions really that we all need to ask ourselves, and we need to do it on a, at least an occasional basis. For some, it's just simply the habit of it's Sunday. It's time to get up and put on our, our better clothes or our best clothes or whatever and go to church. It's just that time. For some, it's the idea of, well, we get to come and we get to, to, to go through an exercise. Or for some, it's the idea of, well, I get to go see my friends. I get to go see my buddies. There's all different reasons why folks might give for worship. But let's understand what worship is before we get into uh, what we're going to talk about this morning. In the New Testament Greek, there are about three words, that, different words, that are all translated worship at one time or another through the text. To break them down simply to kind of put together, if you will, the whole definition of worship through these words, you find out that worship is a service. It is that which you do. It doesn't necessarily have to be done on Sunday, but we do know that when we worship we do it on Sunday, and we'll see why in a few minutes. But our worship is what we give. It is what we do, but it is what we give, because in defining the terms, we understand that worship is giving honor and praise, giving homage to. When we come together to worship, we come together to worship God. So when we come together to worship God, we are giving God honor, Honor, praise, homage. We are giving him his, as one uh, theologian said, we are giving him his worth-ship. In other words, we are praising him, glorifying him for who he is, what he's done, and what he is doing. But worship can be broken down. As we ask the question, about what is worship, we understand, well, okay, worship is giving glory and honor and praise to God. But we have to understand that worship time is special. While we will allocate for ourselves a period of Bible school on Sunday morning from 9 to 9.45 or such, and 
worship from 10 to 11, depending upon when the preacher will let us out, and worship on Sunday night, 6 to 7, Wednesday night, 6.30 to 7.30. We may say, okay, this is the allotted time for worship. What am I accomplishing? Worship is a time, first of all, of reminding. We come together, we sing. Brother Steve leads us, Brother Jim leads us, Billy leads us from time to time, Jay leads us from time to time. We come together to sing. Why do we sing? Paul reminds us in two passages why we sing. We sing because the Bible tells us to sing. We're to, to remind each other. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. That's what Paul would write to the church of Colossae in Colossians chapter 3. In verse 16, he would remind them as well in, in, to the church at Ephesus in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 19, speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. The idea of singing was that which, from a historical standpoint, was done in the early church. The idea of other types of music within the worship service, from a historical standpoint, were not found until much later after the first century church. Thus an addition by man. But we are, as the Hebrew writer reminds us in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 15, that we are individuals that are to therefore offer up the sacrifice of praise to God continually that is the fruit of our lips. We're singers. We not, may not be good singers. I am not. But we are to be singers. To sing. But if worship is singing, what is it accomplishing? It is reminding us. What did he say? Teaching and admonishing one another. We sing, we sang mostly hymns this morning about worship because Steve and I we try to coordinate when I think of it to ask him. And and, and so he asked me Friday night as we were leaving, I said, Hey, worship. And so, you know, you sang about worship. When you look at the songs that we sing, we sing about heaven and we sing about the church and we sing about God and we sing about Jesus and we sing about, about different areas of God, his guidance, his love, his providence, his care. We sing about Jesus and what a friend we have in Jesus and the cross and the old rugged cross. We talk about and sing about salvation, amazing grace and other songs. We, we a plethora, if you will, of, of subjects and are in songs that we sing. But what is singing? It's reminding us of those responsibilities. And it's reminding us of those blessings and those praises that we have. And so when we sing, we are teaching. We are teaching each other. Notice what it says. Each other, one another. The idea of one another is one to the other. Now, <clears throat> admittedly, the way we have constructed our auditoriums in the United States does not lend itself naturally to singing, really, and to accomplishing exactly what we are to accomplish. Stop and think about it. What do you sing to? The back of whoever's head's in front of you, right? But that's not really what it's all about. It's about teaching and admonishing. Now, as we sing... Because we have four walls and a ceiling, thank the good Lord, we're able to hear what others are putting out. By the way, those of you in the back miss out because you see all the sound comes this way. Right, Steve? Singing's better up here. That's, it sounds best right here than it does in the back. But that may be a preference of yours to sit back there, and that's fine. But nevertheless, what are we doing? We're reminding each other. We're reminding each other of whatever the subject is that we're singing. And so we sing for the purpose of reminding one another of the love, the blessings, the responsibilities that we have in God. And so when we sing, we sing according to scriptures, but we sing in order to teach. What about prayer? What is prayer? We worship God through prayer. 
Prayer is the idea of requesting, isn't it? When we think about prayer, we know that we are to pray. Men ought always to pray and not to think. Pray without ceasing. The Bible tells us, Luke 18, 1, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17. That we're to be folks that are constantly given to prayer. And when you look, Jesus prayed, prayed often. When you look at Paul, he often talked about, to his epistles, he would talk about praying. That he'd prayed for the brethren, he'd prayed for this, or he'd prayed for that. We're to be praying people. Prayer is important because of what it accomplishes. Prayer invokes the very Godhead of which we honor through the Word of God. We read in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 6, where Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount says, When you pray, enter into your closet, and your Father which sees in secret shall reward you openly. When we pray, we invoke God, we invoke His help, but we understand that we're praying to God, who what? Who hears, who sees, who understands. When we pray, we are also not only invoking, if you will, God the Father, but what about the Son? In Romans chapter 8, Paul would write there in verse 34 where he, he, he talks about Christ. Who is he that intercedes? It's Christ that gave up his, himself upon the cross. And where is he now? He's at the right hand of God. According to First, Thess- First Timothy chapter 2 and verse 4, he becomes then our mediator. You see, he becomes the one that we can go, we go through him to God because he takes it and he takes it to God. And he says, here's what's being said. But then we invoke the Spirit of God as well, don't we? According to Romans chapter 8, that when we do not know how to pray as we ought, the Spirit himself helps us. The idea of he helps us with our prayers. There are things that we don't know exactly how to carry before the very throne of God, that we don't know how to approach God with this issue, or the fact that they're beyond maybe even our words and capabilities to express, that the Spirit of God does that. And so, yes, the whole Godhead is involved in our prayers. But as it is, we're invoking God. We're requesting things. We're asking of him certain things. And as we ask, as we request of him, we understand that we are invoking, first of all, his providential care, that beloved psalm of Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. How does he become the shepherd of my life by me, of course, following his will and making him the shepherd of my life, making him the one that directs my life, the one that I follow as I walk with him. I'm promised, as the psalmist says, I shall not want. Doesn't mean won't have problems. Doesn't mean won't have difficulties. Doesn't mean I won't have times of heartache and disappointment or things that that are very hard to go through. It just simply means that I have a God that hears, a Jesus that carries, a spirit that helps in my prayer life. And so I have laid my request before God. You see, when I pray, I'm requesting God's help. Now, you might say, well, preacher, I, I can pray prayers of thanksgiving, and, and I'm not. That's right. But think about the bulk of your prayer and the bulk of your prayer life. Jesus, in the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew chapter 6, talks about, and we've so often termed it, the Lord's Prayer. It's not a correct title. Let's call it the model prayer. The model prayer in which Jesus gave begins as we remember it. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be your name. The idea of hallowed is the idea of, of lifting them up in praise and adoration. And as he says, your kingdom come, your will be done. Preacher, kingdom's already come, you're right, it has. See, this is why we can't say that prayer verbatim unless we understand what we're talking about. The kingdom has already come. 
But we can and do and should and hopefully do request God's help with regards to the church. That's what the kingdom is. It's the church. And so since it is, when we come together to worship God, those that lead the prayers from time to time, you'll hear them talk about the kingdom, the church, the church here at River Road, the elders, the deacons, the preacher. Appreciate Ken's prayer this morning. We pray for the kingdom. Our request is for the kingdom. Give us this day our daily bread. We request the things that we need, the essentials that we need, food to eat, clothes on our backs and roofs over our heads. Not only do we request them, but we also spend time in thanksgiving for them. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. What are we saying there? We're requesting God's forgiveness for the sins that we've committed, for the things that we've done, for the things that we've said, for the things we've done. Lord, forgive us for our sins. Lead us not into temptation. Lord, watch over us this week. Help us to be better individuals this week than what we were last week. Make sure that if you can, Lord, when we know we can, but if you will, Lord, keep devil at bay from me and from my family. And so as you lead us not into temptation, Lord, deliver us from evil or from the evil one. You see, when we request or when we pray, we're requesting, requesting God's help, requesting his love, requesting his care, requesting him not just to be in our presence nor to be in just his presence but to be present and as being present in our lives help us Lord to get through this life and help us to help others and help others to get through their life and so when we come together to worship we come together to pray as well What is that prayer? It's requesting of God and requesting of what he has and can do and what he will do. But it's also remembering. When we worship, we come to remember. We come to take the Lord's Supper. Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all three have the accounts of Jesus instituting the Lord's Supper. It was in that upper room in which the disciples were gathered together, and as they were gathered together, Jesus took bread and he blessed it and broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Matthew's account, and he took the cup, he gave thanks, and he gave it to them, saying, Drink all of it, for this is my blood, the New Testament, which was shed for many for the remission of sins. The institution of the Lord's Supper was important. The institution of the Lord's Supper was to Remind us, matter of fact, in Luke's account, in Luke chapter 22, verse 19, Jesus said, take eat, for this is my body, shed for you or given for you. This do in remembrance of me. We gather around the table, as we call it, not literally, but proverbially. We gather around to partake of the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper is made up of two emblems. It's made up of the bread and it's made up of the fruit of the vine. Some religious beliefs only take one at a time, one, usually the bread. But the Lord instituted two elements, the bread, which represents the body of Jesus Christ, the body that that came to this world, because when we understand the text or text from the Bible, we understand that Jesus was with God, yea, before, but at the very beginning of earth's time but came to this world and when he came to this world he gave up according to Philippians chapter 2 his very seat at the right hand of God and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of man he took upon himself this physical form 
And he walked among men. He talked to men. He, he performed the miracles that he performed. He left the teachings that he left. But Jesus came to show men to God and to carry men to God through the fruit of the vine, which represents the blood of Christ in order that we might have the hope of heaven that we have. The Lord's Supper, then, is memorial feast. I cannot prove what I'm about to say through Scripture, so therefore, please indulge me, but understand it's Paul Darty's opinion. And that is that when we come together upon the first day of the week, we come together and we partake the Lord's Supper. It is a time for us to refocus our attention on what this week has probably taken away from many of us, and that is the Lord. And so when Jesus said, take, eat, this is my body, which was shed for you, this do in remembrance, when we gather around the table, our mind can go elsewhere. Why? Because it's quiet. You know, you get quietness, at least in my head, and my head goes 11 million places, and probably yours too. What are we going to do? How long is the preacher going to preach? Wonder what Steve's next song is going to be. Wonder what, what the brother's going to say at the table. You know, I hope I, I hope I turned my car off when I got out. Any of you thinking that? Don't want to answer that. I had a brother that left his car on one worship service. But, but you, know, <clears throat> you know, our mind just goes 11 million places. But it's a time of remembering, a time of refocusing upon the Lord, calling us back to come back. Preacher, you, we take of this Lord's Supper upon the first day of every week. Yeah. Why? Because in Acts chapter 20 and verse 7, upon the first day of the week, when the disciples gathered together to break bread, Paul, ready to depart the next day, preached. Do what? Upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, it was not a special Sunday. It was not some holy day or some feast day. It was not, if you will, it was not just the first Sunday of the quarter or the third Sunday of the second month of the first year of the equinox. They came together upon the first day of every week, and they came together to take the Lord's Supper. Now, we've got to be careful that we don't make the Lord's Supper more than what it is. The Lord's Supper will not get you into heaven. There are some that believe that. I have a friend that told me, he's a preacher, he told me, he said, I watched this one Sunday, it happened in, in our church building. And I said, well, what happened? He said, an individual came in the back door, front door, you know, front door, back door, you understand. But they came in the door. They walked down to the table. This is when, of course, it all spread it out. They came down to the table. They, they bowed their heads, took the bread, bowed their heads again, took the fruit of the vine, and turned around and walked out. I said, well, who were they? Were they some of your members? No, never seen them before in my life. Well, to them, the only thing to do was to take the Lord's Supper. And that's not the way we've seen it. We've already seen what we're seeing, pray. But the Lord's Supper is vital aspect through which we worship God. It is an avenue through which we worship God. But it is a time of remembering the Lord. When we come together, we are reminded then of Jesus, his sacrifice, his life, his teachings, his sacrifice, and what he's done for us. And so when we worship, we come for the purpose of remembering but we also come for the purpose of revival. Oh, I knew he was going to have to get to preaching. Yeah. We come for, in order to, to preach. But what's really preaching? Preaching in many ways is revival. It's also remembering as well. Peter talked about in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 13, that as long as he was in this tent, 
that it would do well to remind the brethren. Remind them of what? Well, if you go to 2 Peter chapter 3, he says that I stir up your minds by way of remembrance. Preaching really is or should be about reminding. Now, that doesn't mean that sometimes a preacher will not redirect our thoughts in a way that maybe we either haven't thought about or haven't thought about in a long time. But if we know the Word, because we're students of the Word of God, like we should be, then what is the preacher doing? He is preaching what? Preach the Word, Paul told Timothy. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke with all long-suffering and doctrine. Preach the Word. What's the Word? The Word's the Word of God. The Word's this Bible. The Word's this text. Our goal is to, to preach. Why? How shall they believe on him in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? How beautiful are the feet of them which preach the gospel of peace. Glad tidings. Romans chapter 10, beginning in verse 14. We preach the word. We preach the truth. And as we preach the truth, we preach it because that's what they did. They did it in Acts 20, verse 7. We've already looked at that. When they gathered together to take the Lord's Supper, Paul preached unto them, ready to leave the next day. Preaching thus, though, has an importance. Preaching has an importance because what we are trying to do is reach the hearts and minds and souls of individuals to remember what they've been taught, to remember what they've they've studied, But to have a revival of spirit that says, I'm willing now and I can go out now this next week and I can face what I need to face. I can face temptation and I can face Satan and I can live a better life, more centered upon God. Now, that doesn't mean that some lessons won't touch your heart better and quicker and and more than others. But it is to say that We have, as preachers, a responsibility to revive that spirit. Well, how do I know that? Well, I go once again to the Bible, and I go to to a wonderful passage in which Jesus goes into the synagogue. And when he goes into the synagogue, he has to go behind. Synagogues were basically, they, they were empty buildings. They didn't have pews. Folks sat on the floor around the edge, and there was a bench in front, and that's usually where the teacher sat. And right behind it, there was a box. And if they were fortunate enough, there would be some scriptures in those boxes in Luke chapter 4. Jesus is there, and he's asked to teach, and he opens up the scriptures. And he reads, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, the recovering of sight to blind, and give deliverance, set at liberty those that are bruised. He closed that scripture. He put it back in the box. And he says, folks, today within your hearing, this has been fulfilled. What's, what's the point? Well, notice what he said. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel, the good news to the poor. He sent me to heal the broken heart. I can't heal, but I can help through preaching. He sent me to heal the broken heart and preach deliverance to the captives. Preach deliverance to the captives and the recovering of sight to the blind. He's hint. That's what preaching is all about. Preaching is all about reviving the spirit. You see, when we come, we have the attitude, oh, there he goes again. He's going to tell another story. He's going to quote another scripture. He, he's, going to, he's going to go long. He's going to go forever. When we come to worship, while preaching is not the main thing, it's part of it. We come for the purpose of revival. Truly, we all need a revival. But 
when we come to worship, we also come with the idea of returning. Giving. We give. You know, you used to, as you pass the plates, we would do it at the end, you know. And we all thought, or not all, but many thought through the years, giving was part of the Lord's Supper. No. In congregations, some of the congregations where I worked with, I encouraged the elders that, that we take the Lord's Supper and then we have a song or a prayer or something in between the Lord's Supper and giving to break it up so that people understand. We did that in some places, didn't do it in every place I've worked in before. Giving now, of course, because of the way we do it, we ask you if, if you get, are to give, that you give in the box that's out in the foyer on the table. Giving is, is what we're supposed to do. Why? Because that's what they did. Upon the first day of the week, quote the old King James, let every one of you lay by him in store as God has prospered. There will be no gatherings when I come. You see, Paul said upon the first day of the week, which week? Every week. We give. We give what? We give money. We give back to the Lord. We give that which we have prospered. It may not be a big sum. Matter of fact, Jesus was sitting across from the treasury, and there's the the, the widow that brings two mites. You know how much two mites is? It would be equivalent to two pennies in our denomination of money today. He said, this widow dropped in two mites, and she's given, she's given more than the rest of you. Why? Because she gave all that she had. Well, preacher, we can't give all that we have every week. You know, how am I going to pay my bills? How am I going to dress? How am I going to eat? How am I going to pay my mortgage? How am I going to have a car? We understand that. Well, how much should we give? Under the old law, you gave a tenth. A tenth of everything you, you took in. The new law does not require that. But the new law requires that we give. That we give as and in accordance as we've been prospered. Some folks are stuck in their giving. In other words, what they gave 10 years ago is what they still give today, even though they've had incremental increases through the years in what they have. Some folks give based upon what's left over. In other words, after I've paid all my bills, if there's anything left over, then I give to the Lord. Scriptures tell us, though, to give as we've been prospered, to give as we're told. And according to 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 7, we're told to let each one of you give as he has purposed in his heart. Not grudgingly, necessity. God loves a cheerful giver. But here's the caveat to that verse. It's the verse before it. The verse before it says, He that sows sparingly will reap sparingly, and he that sows bountifully shall reap bountifully. Then he says, Let each one of you give as his purpose to his heart. Why is that verse before it there? Because that verse before it tells us that if we give, God's going to give back to us. But if we are stingy, God's going to be stingy with us. We reap what we sow. And so we give with a willing and cheerful heart. Now, I'd say it may be a small amount, but we may make a small amount. That's all right. But we give as we have prospered. And our responsibility is to give. What are we doing? We are returning a portion of what we have received from God physically back to God. Well, no. Well, think about what it does. Think about our budget. Think about paying the preacher. Yeah, that's a huge part of our budget, paying the preacher. Yes. Why? Well, you know, two Bible class, a Bible class and a sermon on Sunday morning, sermon on Sunday night, a, a class on Wednesday night, NHC devotional, love doing all of those things, love doing every one of them, bulletin, you know, teaching, helping. Visiting, encouraging, sure. We also support a missionary. Brother Adriano and the great work that he does in Brazil. What else do we do? Well, we're just like you. We have bills that have to be paid. 
we help certain organizations that that carry out some good things, such as children's homes and and disaster relief and other things benevolently. We do those things. Why? Because God has said, but we do those things based upon our returning and we return or give because we have been told to give. And so when we come to worship, what are we doing? Yeah, preacher, we're praying, we're singing, we're listening to preaching, we're taking the Lord's Supper, and we're giving. We are. And after it's all over with, I want to add one R. This is in conclusion, but I want to add one R. We're rejoicing. Yeah, preacher, you got that right. We're rejoicing that you finally got through. We're rejoicing that we get to go home. We're rejoicing we get to go to the restaurant. We get to go eat. No, no, no. We're rejoicing in one another, in the fellowship with one another. We're rejoicing that we get to spend time with one another, see one another that we often haven't seen since last week, to find out the news of what's going on in their lives, how they're doing, how they're feeling, what's going on with them. We're rejoicing in them. It's called fellowship. That's why we did that to the the foyer, so we got space, space to see each other and talk without feeling like we're standing on one another or smelling one another's breath. We have the opportunity to enjoy and to be strengthened by one another. And so... When we come to worship, we worship God. With the whole idea of worshiping him in spirit, John 4, and in truth. This morning, if you're not a part of that kingdom and you need to, to put on your Lord and Savior in baptism for the remission of your sins, or having done that, you need to rededicate your life. Our prayer is that you'll come. All together we stand and sing.